because obviously there, I know there's people on the call who um, are highly involved in Scottish politics. Um, so I, I apologise if there's anything I say that people kind of feel is maybe taken as a given. Um, in terms of where I'm coming from, I'm somebody that's been involved in the Labour and Trade Union movement since the 1980s. I was involved in the left of the party um, and in, in, involved in many, many campaigns, anti-cuts campaigns, campaigns for workers' rights. Um, so a focus that wasn't so much on constitutional issues. Um, I was, however, involved in many of the discussions around the Scottish Constitutional Convention that led to the proposals um, which were put to a referendum in 1997. And I was involved in Scotland United, which was the campaign after the 1992 election, um, which a lot of people in Scotland were involved in. So when the referendum happened last time, I was very involved in anti-austerity campaigning and campaigning around about workers' rights. And the Constitution wasn't necessarily something that I was spending my time focusing on. And it was a two and a half year campaign. Um, so at the beginning of it, I think lots of people were probably in the position I was in, that they weren't heavily engaged in the independence um, campaign in Scotland. But over the two and a half years of the campaign, it became a massive dividing line in Scottish politics, which remains to this day. So I think the first thing I would say is that I, my impression is that for a lot of people in Scotland, emotionally and politically, probably the independence issue is higher up their agenda in normal times than the European issue and whether we're a member of the European Union or not. So my personal view is that irrespective of their views on the European Union and whether we should be a member of the European Union, most people in Scotland will vote in a referendum on independence um, on other issues, not the European issue and whether we're in Europe or we're not in Europe. I may be wrong about that because things change in politics, um, but that was definitely my impression during the last referendum and it remains my impression. Um, now, obviously, the political context that any referendum will take place in will determine what are the most important factors that determine you know, people's attitudes and whether they want to um, vote one way or another way. And the political backdrop um, is one at this stage we don't know. Um, so if there is another referendum, we don't know what the implications of the coronavirus are going to be at a European level in terms of European economic policy, um, what impact that's going to have on the sort of neoliberal policies that Europe has pursued for a number of decades, whether that's going to have um, an impact on how Europe looks at the issues of collective risk, whether, for example, you know, there would be changes made so that the Greek situation wouldn't be allowed to happen again, where um, you know, the, 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 the Greek people were, were forced into such draconian measures. So it's perfectly possible that Europe itself may undergo massive changes as a result of what we're going through at the moment. Or it may be that many people think we just go back to business as Europe and that we go back to kind of austerity politics, if you like, in the same way that we don't know what the implications are going to be um, of coronavirus in terms of UK politics and what that's going to mean in terms of the economy. And also whether a change in the economic position is going to be a major factor in how people would view the independence issue in Scotland. So all of these things I think are are issues that we need to discuss, but to a large extent, we don't know um, what the answers to all these questions are going to be um, at the moment. Um, so um, what, what I would say really in terms of, of the Europe issue is that I think Europe will be central in any discussion um, about independence um, going forward. Um, and depending on the nature of the Brexit deal or no deal, um, then I think we're talking about a very different set of discussions that will take place. In broad terms, what I would say is that the harder the Brexit and the greater the divergence between the UK and Europe, um, then the harder any border would be in the event um, of a yes vote in an independence referendum. Now, other people may disagree with that and that might be what you know, that might be a discussion going forward. But it would seem to me that a lot of the issues that were debated in the last referendum, around about, for example, currency, which was a big issue in the last referendum, the, um, the proposal was that we maintain the pound. There were other people who supported yes, who said that there should be a different currency or that we should be in the euro. 
those kind of issues, I suspect, yet again, are going to be central um, in any referendum that there might be again on independence. What I would say is um, that it, there was a big change, I think, during the referendum in people's voting's intention last time. The nature of politics is that things don't necessarily happen the same way again. That That's just no one can predict with any certainty what will happen. Um, but there seemed to be a significant shift in favour of the independence position during the referendum last time. And um, for those of you who maybe are not, you know, thinking about Scotland all the time, the, the eventual vote was just under 45% of people voted yes and just over 55% of people voted no. Now, most of the um, polling that's been done since the last referendum still has a no position. And um, that really has only changed quite recently because there was a, a very small number of polls at the, before the coronavirus um, outbreak where th there was a sort of 50, 52% people were saying they would vote yes. Now, I, I don't think at this stage, and that probably was to do with Europe, I suspect, maybe, not sure. Um, so, so what I would really say, just sort of winding up and maybe hoping to sort of open out the discussion um, is that um, I think the, any future discussion is going to be against a different political backdrop. Um, Europe will be a factor in that. I personally suspect it will only be one factor. Um, and whatever happens in Scotland, the problem that we have is that the country is divided. And if there is another referendum, um, whichever way it goes, it's probably going to be relatively close. And in my opinion, we can't have this issue dominating Scotland forever because I personally believe, and this will be not agreed with by everybody, but it means that in many ways we don't focus on, on the major structural um, and political and social challenges we have in Scotland where we have such um, you know, massive um, wealth gaps and power gaps within society. So hopefully that's something that will get the discussion going. Okay, thank you very much, Katie, and thank you for taking us through the different timelines and uh, the, the debate as it developed. So I'd like to now invite Graham to share his point of view and uh, hopefully also uh, take us on a bit of a time journey through the uh, episodes <laughs> as they're unfolding still. You're muted, Graham. Uh, once again, unmute. <sighs> Yes, all in 10 minutes, I will do that. <laughs> um, okay, I actually will say that I agree with a fair bit of uh, Katie's and um, Pricey analysis there. Um, and I think that she points to a very obvious uh, reason why the EU question is still important to the debate. It's around what kind of exit we have if we exit. And clearly, the, the, you know, whatever deal is worked out for Northern Ireland, is also going to be key to whatever deal might be worked out for Scotland in the context of an indie ref. And it, so it, it is going to be the fault line of this debate if we have another referendum soon. What is the nature of the hard border? Uh, and how hard will it be? What uh, will be the different market conditions, customs-wise, trade-wise, across that border should Scotland become an independent country post-deal or no-deal? And, and it's fairly obvious that if it's a no-deal situation, that uh, that will have a, a series of damaging consequences for the economy in, in obviously north and south of the border but particularly it poses us some different questions as to how our government will then react and what economic policies an independent scotland has to Im implement it would make uh, one of the solutions and katie rightly points to the currency issue having been one of the main uh, fault lines within the debate and probably the main reason why we lost i should say that i'm in glasgow we voted very strongly yes in Glasgow, as did Dundee. And one of the reasons why that happened, and Katie will be, and everyone will be aware of some of the reasons that, you know, say 57% of the people in my part of Glasgow and East End uh, voted yes, uh, as did parts of uh, Dundee too. So there was quite a solid working class block vote for change. Uh, in 2014, which was in the context of austerity. So in a sense, you have to understand uh, that there's two parallel movements, one for independence being a progressive outcome and option north of the border, and in south of the border that 
transpired into Corbynism. That's where that, they're both movements that come from an anti-austerity impulse in politics against what the Tories were doing. Uh, but they obviously went down different paths for the obvious reasons of the constitutional difference here. Um, I should say that I'm one of those people who, we, we, there's a lot of talk about, and understandably, about the post-2014 mass way when we lost the referendum for independence but then massive numbers of people then went and joined the SNP. Um, I didn't, I resisted that wave because although I vote SNP and I vote pro-independence, I, 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 I was not a member of the SNP at that point. Um, I joined the day after the Brexit referendum. I arrived uh, from a flight of about 200 Jamaicans that gone to Jamaica to do a documentary about Scotland's slavery links and uh, I arrived and the captain of my plane actually announced the result at seven o'clock in the morning when we landed at Gatwick. I can tell you the shock that we all had that, that way well, Britain had voted uh, to, to leave the EU was a shock to us. But then trying to travel through England on the way back to Scotland, and I noticed the atmosphere was different. People were looking at me and it, there was a very tangible, noticeable wave of extreme far-right nationalism coming out of a lot of people both north and south of this border. It, it was also attracted, it should be pointed out that not all of that reaction to Brexit's uh, success was, uh, was negative. I suppose there was a, a galvanizing of progressive people uh, you know, against the immigration policy. There was a progressive sort of uh, outbreak of love and solidarity for the refugees stranded in Turkey in the, in the Greek Turkish border. So there was a, 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 an outpouring of solidarity for them and that group solidarity groups came up all over the country so not all of brexit's reaction was was entirely negative but people responded to it politically um, and i was one of those people who joined the snp that day uh, there's one about five thousand people who joined that day the day after the eu referendum and i think katie's generally right that there's been a sort of uh, I suppose stalemate around the percentages, but what the percentages for and against independence hide is the, the shifting sands of which sections of the population are moving to yes and or staying where they are. I think my impression is that about 40% of the people are very, very definitely going to vote yes, and about 40% of the people are very definitely going to vote no. What, what come what may because they are emotionally attached to the positions they've had. That's why they're voting for the political parties they've voted for in all the elections since 2014. Yes and no defines uh, electoral politics in Scotland. But uh, an important factor is where does that 20% that's undecided or who may have voted yes last time but might vote, vote no this time and vice versa, where's that section of the population going? And particularly the EU question is one of those questions where People who voted no, but, but remain in 2016, moved, have moved decisively to yes in the last two to three years. And that puts you know, yes in the territory before we even had a referendum campaign of getting near to 50% at the starting point. Remember that in 2014, the yes campaign started at 28% support for independence. So it's pretty clear that the solid bedrock support for independence, for all sorts of reasons, is much, much higher, starting from a much more higher support base. And I think the general reason for that is that people see that Scotland's best governed for itself, and I think that's fairly obvious. But one of the issues around the European membership is that Scotland doesn't have the same debate around hostility towards foreigners or uh, you know, hostility towards the French or the Germans in quite the same way that that has uh, traction down south. Um, it, it reflects itself on, on who we vote for. I mean, that's why, although we had a, a, a UKIP guy for several years, we did, you know, we've got a Brexit guy currently. I don't know if he's in the Brexit party anymore, but you know, the fact is that the Brexit party not only did not win the election in Scotland for the Euro elections, they came last out of the, the main parties and they got one M MS MEP, whereas the Brexit party won the election everywhere else in the UK. So we're clearly different. We think about Europe very differently in Scotland, and there's a good reason for that. We see ourselves as a European nation. But how do we relate to the EU project? I suppose as a socialist, I want to start on the big thing. I think we'll all agree here that we, we're internationalists. We want to start from the point that 
that progressive Europe has to start with working class people uniting across all those borders and fighting to change the way Europe does its business. Um, uh, many of us, like I would have started back in the late 80s and early 90s when I started being politically active as quite a Eurosceptic. And, you know, I was in the Labour Party. I was actually, from, I'm actually from Islington North, so I know Jeremy Corbyn from those days. So uh, I was active in the Labour Party when the majority of the Labour left were very, very sceptical about Europe, but engaging with it and trying to change it, uh, and trying to change its structures. That was easier to said than done when the majority of governments in the European project were either social democratic or left wing aligned. For most of the time the European Union's existed since the Amsterdam Treaty, the majority of the governments have been right wing. So it's not a surprise that Europe's policy responses have been right wing and neoliberal when all of the governments, nearly all of them, have been right wing and neoliberal in their composition. So until people start voting for progressive governments, we're not likely to see much change out of that. I do agree with Katie that I think the the questions of currency and also what the post-COVID uh, situation will be. It's pretty clear that COVID will change the dynamics of how European capitalism works. It will change how British capitalism works. How much of uh, the state intervention that we have now lasts after the COVID is a matter of struggle from below and how much citizens enforce their will about what they think should be in public and social control. Uh, and that fight will be across Europe and it makes sense for us to be part of that. I reckon that the currency reason was the main reason why people didn't vote yes last time. And the obvious answer should have been, we have our own currency. We don't have sterlingization. There's very strong opposition to that in the SNP. We voted against it, uh, lasting any lengthening period of time. Um, probably neutral on whether the Euro, we should join that uh, or not. But actually I think the best option for us if we can't immediately rejoin the European Union and then we could join EFTA. Many people within the SNP think joining EFTA might be an option in the short term until we're able to actually be independent, join uh, as an independent country of our own currency. Um, but my preference would be that Scotland should have its own currency post-independence and that must be part of the pro-independence offer. We can be part of the European Union that will require, I think if we're forced out and we're outside when we, when we have an independent country, then we'll have to have a referendum to come back in. Thank you so much for that uh, and also for sharing your impressions of um, the day when the, the Brexit referendum results were, uh, were announced. And I think um, many of us, uh, such as myself, so, so migrants from the EU27 countries uh, to the UK have noticed exactly the same uh, uh, reaction that you refer to. And thank you for also talking about the impact of COVID-19 on, on the nature of the European project. And of course, for mentioning Northern Ireland, because I do think uh, that, the, the, that the questions are becoming actually uh, even closer linked by, by the COVID-19 uh, response. So thanks for that. And um, I'm extremely curious to hear from Adam now. Um, if you'd like to, to share your views uh, with us, please do so. And I think there will be an opportunity after that to also refer uh, to each other. Uh, so, so please uh, share your views and then um, we'll have a chance to have you respond to each other. Yes. Sure. Well, um, thanks, Katie and Graham, for your thoughts. I agree with a lot of what's been said about the sort of timeline running up to now and the context. So I'm going to try and talk a little bit about um, what I might see as some of the underlying forces at play and some of the things that are going on. And I think that to kind of start with that, I think we need to start with the interaction between the British state and Anglo-British nationalism, which is the dominant kind of uh, cultural force in the UK today, and think about how the intertwining of those two have taken us to where we are. So, you know, the British state um, is... Uh, along with its overseas territories and crown protectorates, the world's biggest money laundry. It's uh, so heavily privatized that the UK is now the world's center for mercenary companies because it's one of the few countries which has significantly privatized its military. Um, it's closely tied to the city of London. It uh, doesn't have a codified constitution in common with Saudi Arabia and Israel. And as a result, kind of defaults to an elite rule system of the crown in parliament based on a sort of absurd understanding of the monarchy, which is, um, kind of, I think, key in propping up the sort of uh, emotional sense of Anglo-British nationalism, which um, holds together a lot of kind of post-imperial Britain. And one of the things I find fascinating is the questions that 
are never really discussed in English politics. So there's very little discussion about the question of why it is that England votes Tory. Um, it's, you know, it was often cited during the independence referendum quite accurately that people in England on the whole are almost as left wing as people in Scotland and in fact the rest of Europe. Their polls statistically show that you know, they're only kind of 5% more right wing on anything from you know, wanting to renationalize most things. Most people are basically social democrats economically. Um, they're basically socially liberal on most issues. People tend to support uh, abortion rights. They tend to support LGBT rights and so on. And yet, consistently, the people of England go out and vote for a political party, the Conservatives, which doesn't really represent any of those issues, which they don't agree with on most things. And, and why is that? That's because the Conservatives are the party of Anglo-British nationalism and the institutions of the British state. And there is, particularly in England, a kind of a long memory and unchallenged memory of a time when the British state was largely able to deliver, obviously unequally, but able to deliver in different ways to the peoples of Britain, um, largely because they were able to go around the world killing people of colour and stealing their stuff through the empire. And <clears throat> what's happened since then, I think, um, is that, you know, we've seen the foundation of the EU uh, as Western states came out of colonialism. And the EU was sort of a sandpit for these kind of new states that were born out of empire, the imperial states themselves that were kind of born out of empire, like the British states and the French states and so on, to um, begin to find their own identities and build their own economic realities. And, and that kind of you know, ran alongside the period of neoliberalism we've had over the last 40 or 50 years. And, and that is beginning to decay. Both those forces are beginning to decay um, kind of in parallel. So, you know, as, as we've heard, Scotland is um, increasingly, and you know, I think that the three polls after the general election were very significant, you know, that, that there is a significant generational shift in Scotland towards support for independence, which I think we can see in simple terms as anyone who is kind of old enough or rather young enough to have grown up with the Scottish Parliament. So I, I, was, I, mean, I was born in Scotland, not that you guessed from my accent. Um, and it was, it was convened when I was 13. So you know, my whole political life, there's been a Scottish Parliament, and you look at the two institutions, and the Scottish Parliament feels like it's trying to negotiate towards kind of the best outcome for the country, even if you disagree with the individual policies it pushes at different times. Whereas Westminster looks like this sort of absurd circus tied to kind of ideas of its own importance in the mid 19th century. And that exists largely to enrich an elite. And the reason it looks like it, that is that that's basically what it is. And so the question we then have, um, both in the UK and in Scotland and right across Europe really, is, is what to do with these institutions, because Europe is also in, in a very deep crisis. You know, the uh, COVID um, crisis in particular has kind of accelerated a lot of these forces. But if you look at um, Italy, uh, support for leaving the EU in Italy now you know, has, has increased by about 20% in the last month and is now about 50-50 with remaining in the EU. Um, I spent February wandering around Central Europe interviewing people about their view of politics and how they understand it in Hungary and in Slovakia and in Czechia and, and so on. And you know, very clear that the levels of alienation in Central and Eastern Europe are, you know, probably higher than they are here. And, and, you know, while they're not likely to leave the EU, they are furious with the structures of the EU, which are seen as, you know, imposing um, kind of distant governance on them. And I think that leaves the left and the left in Scotland with a series of questions about how we address these crises. Because the, you know, the era of sort of neoliberal globalization has come to an end in, in you know, it's been dying for 10 years. But in the last two months, we have seen the end of the previous era. And so the question is, what is the role of the left in shaping the new era? And for me, um, I do feel that, you know, I, I see no reason why as a Scottish person, I'd want to be governed by the British state. Um, I, I don't see Anglo-British nationalism changing sufficiently on its own, you know, without Scotland and Northern Ireland leaving, um, that I see any reason why we continue to want to be governed from Westminster and Whitehall, which are a sort of decaying, you know, increasingly failing state run increasingly for quite a small elite. I, I do continue to feel, and I accept that this is perhaps a position of um, hope, uh, or what, you know, what do they say, uh, uh, 
optimism of the will rather than uh, the pessimism of the intellect. But um, I do continue to think that there is a possibility of a European project. The current European project is dying in coronavirus and the right will work very hard to refound a, a new European project in its ashes before we've even noticed that it's died and we won't realise for a long time what they've replaced it with unless we begin to act very fast now through this crisis to work out what kind of European institutions and what kind of Europe we want, not because Europe itself is important, but because the EU is the first and the most significant experiment we have in the globalised world in transnational democracy. And if we're going to see a new kind of globalisation emerging from this crisis, then we have, you know, Europe is the best chance we have of kind of thinking through the kind of globalised or at least transnational institutions we want to have. I think that's going to be a massive challenge. But what does that mean for Scotland? Um, I think that it continues to mean that, you know, people are seeing the British state failing significantly in this crisis, um, as we have seen over the last two decades. But, you know, the, the fact that uh, coronavirus is now, you know, the UK is now the centre of coronavirus in Europe is a result of the failures of the British state. Um, people in Scotland, even more than before, are looking to the Scottish government for a kind of better response. And while the Scottish government struggled to deliver that initially, I think it is beginning to separate itself out from the UK government, and that will continue to create the impression that, you know, why would you want Westminster governing other key policies, key economic policies and, and foreign policy and so on? Why not give those to Holyrood, which is, of course, what independence means? Um, and I think that they're going to continue to see a deep, deep crisis across Europe and that, you know, this could kill off the EU, um, but the, the role of the left has to be in fighting for some kind of transnational democracy because capital is transnational and we have to continue to hold it account at the level it exists at. And, um, and that leaves us with the role probably through the uh, municipalities and the cities which are increasingly controlled from the left um, to kind of rebirth some kind of European project. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for sharing your point of view. And um, I've enjoyed listening to each of you. It's just the quite different perspective and they're coming together very nicely. I see our panelists have been very active. Uh, sorry, our attendees, our audience has been very active in writing questions, uh, but not so much in raising their, their uh, hand. Uh, so perhaps uh, one common uh, one commonality that I see is uh, in the, the commentaries is the idea on, of a, of a fe federal uh, United Kingdom versus a federal Europe, but also uh, I see uh, comments about a confederation, and I think this refers to, uh, effectively, if I'm not mistaken in reading this, but also to Northern Ireland, uh, and and I don't know if to uh, Ireland as well. Um, so maybe it would be possible to ask each of you uh, for two minutes uh, on, on this topic. And uh, I think we could maybe reverse the order even if uh, Adam is okay going first this time. Sure, so, so I think that at heart, the problem with the idea of a federal UK is, um, is partly the one that some people have pointed out, that 80% of the population is in England, but more significantly for me, I think people misunderstand what federalism is. Federalism is an understanding of power, that power rises up from below and, and you kind of, you know, share it um, as you go up. And the British state is founded on the idea of the Crown in Parliament, that power starts at the centre, um, originally with the divine right of kings and queens, we don't talk about that anymore, but that's essentially how we're governed still, and the, that power is then kind of devolved down through Parliament, which secures legitimacy from the people, and that's where sovereignty lies, and it cas cascades down from there. And you can't have a federal system while you have that model of sovereignty of the Crown in Parliament, because sovereignty in a federal system, sovereignty in any real democracy, has to lie with the people or peoples of the country. So if the UK is going to become federal, that means, um, radically changing the whole constitution, including essentially abolishing the monarchy, or at very least significantly changing the role of the monarchy. And if you, you know, that is what I'd be in favour of, you know, I'd be in favour of doing that, certainly for pe the people of England. But I think that the political likelihood of that is a long way down the list. You know, the support for the monarchy and the role of the monarchy in England is enormous. And 
you know, I think a lot of the reasons that Corbyn lost, the, the ground that Corbyn was attacked on by the right was consistently not his economic agenda or even really most of his sort of social policies. It was that he didn't genuflect it sufficiently to anger British nationalism. He wasn't enough of a royalist. And so I don't think that's plausible. I don't think that we're likely to see any real moves towards any real federalism, any real sense of, you know, taking power away from the Crown in Parliament, shifting it to the people of the country in the current UK state structures. Thank you. Graham, do you agree with that assessment? Do you have a different one you'd like to share? Uh, you're still muted. You have to unmute first. Yes. Um, I agree with much of that, but I, I would put my spin on it this way. Uh, a federal UK, if it was on offer from any of the political parties in, in England, based in England, then it would have attraction to some extent in public opinion because it would be being discussed. The trouble is that only a very small, thin slice of the Labour Party is discussing it, and it's not gaining traction within their party. So it's not gaining a currency because I think, first of all, they can't agree about what it means. Now, to me, to be meaningful, it needs to be complete and symmetrical regionalised devolution of a German or, or Belgian style to be even... Uh, you know, practical, but it needs to answer a fundamental democracy question for the English people, which is that Westminster is an absolutely corrupt, hated, bureaucratic, white hole dominated uh, apparatus, which is a dictatorship in all but name. And we can see that with the Henry VIII powers and Boris's proroguing of parliament. In effect, the people of England and, and, and the United Kingdom are in fact subjects to this apparatus and it's not got democratic control. Now, uh, much of the Euroscepticism we've had in Britain over the last 50 years has been premised on the idea that Westminster is somehow some paragon of democracy. Now, unless the federal question can answer that question, that's why I want to leave. I, I, Scotland is better off leaving because we at least have our own judicial uh, separation. Uh, we run many of our, our, our institutions independently from Edinburgh. Uh, it makes perfect sense to run all of them independently from Edinburgh. To me, there's no question about that. Ireland has a Northern Ireland, that is, has a judicial means of leaving the United Kingdom. It's called a border poll. It's in the Good Friday Agreement. It's one of the lesser advertised bits of it. But Sinn Fein put a, a policy uh, document forward. Uh, around the time of the Brexit referendum, arguing against Brexit, for, uh, but argued this exact point, and it was a thing that was completely missed during that discussion around the vote, uh, that, that it would create the problem that we've had with the 300 mile long border. Now, the person who wrote in the columns there that uh, about whatever deal is worked out for Northern Ireland has obviously a, a much more complication than, than the one between Scotland and England. Whatever works for Northern Ireland will have to be applied to Scotland if we leave. Uh, that's if they have a deal. Uh, but in terms of the state structure, I think that the radical political thing, you know, the Scottish Labour movement started with home rule as one of its fundamental demands. You know, Keir Hardy and Cunningham Graham, the two founders of the Independent Labour Party in Scotland, they, you know, Cunningham Graham went on to found the SNP. So we've always had uh, home rule, self-governance, self-determination at the centre of working class politics. The trouble is that we spent a lot of the 20th century forgetting that uh, because we had this centralised welfare state which did a lot of things for us, which created the NHS and all the progressive things that we will defend. Uh, the trouble is that our attachment to the state is not necessarily helpful to, to going and moving beyond it and even defending those gains that that's, that welfare state gave us. We cannot defend it with this apparatus. And I should say that uh, give tribute to Katie and her comrades because actually they did come quite close. Uh, it should be remembered that despite the total opposition of the hostile media and the way they monster Jeremy, that is 10 million people still voted for the most radical left-wing manifesto there's ever been from the Labour Party. That tells you that there's a support base for that set of politics out of there. Uh, the question is, can, can they have credible leadership on the Europe question? If they had that, they might well have won. But you know. I think to interview now. Um, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, let's hear from Katie, as both of you uh, referred to her as well. And so uh, um, we, we give her a chance to, to respond. <laughs> Okay, if I come in on the issue of federalism and confederalism, um, as Graham says, home rule's always been, um, if you like, a demand within parts of the Labour movement. It was the really the settled position of the Labour Party until the Second World War. And then, um, and I think this links really in an interesting way to the whole economic 
um, sort of issues round about this, which will drive a lot of the decision making in people's heads if there were um, another referendum. Um, really because Scotland did, Scotland was always a poor part of the UK and it did quite well as a result of the, the welfare settlement after um, the Second World War. And of course, one of the, the big issues whenever the, um, the, the independence issue is raised in Scotland is this whole concept of pooling and sharing. And a lot of people that support um, staying within the UK argue a pooling and sharing position, which is the, what they would say is it makes economic sense be, to, it, because of the huge disparities in wealth and power within the UK um, to stay a, as, as part of that. Um, now, as I said earlier on, I was involved in some of the discussions around about the Scottish Constitutional Convention. Um, and, and I didn't, I mean, I voted in favour of the Scottish Parliament. I didn't particularly support those particular package of reforms. I voted no in the independence referendum, but I didn't particularly support either position in the sense I didn't support the status quo and I didn't agree with the proposal that was being put forward. Um, and I, I think this whole idea of, of, of how we relate to each other as nations on a really small island um, it, it is, is incredibly interesting. I don't think we should bring the royal family into it. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I could talk about my position on that, but I don't think you can say that just because there's a royal family means you can't have democratic or fundamental democratic change um, in a society. I think one of the problems with both federalism and confederalism is that a lot of the work hasn't been done. Confederalism, obviously, is when the, the nation, the states, Scotland, England, except would, would mint they, the, if you like, the fundamental sovereignty would lie with them rather than federalism, where the fundamental sovereignty would lie at a UK level. Um, and I think, I think a lot of people in Scotland actually do want to maintain the relationships on what are, is a very small island, a very integrated island. Um, the European Union um, was something we're a member of for, you know, four decades. Um, the, the union between Scotland and England is, is four centuries. And we all know, and particularly people that, that, you know, that have lived in Scotland, have lived in England, have know how integrated the economies are, how life is, the mirroring, mirroring of, you know, even areas which um, are within the domain of the Scottish Parliament. The reality is most laws are the same in Scotland and England. I was a Scottish lawyer, I then requalified in England, and the, the thing I was amazed about was how similar things were. Things were called something different, but actually the, the content was very, very similar. So in terms of the question about federalism, I think there is a, a, a huge reservoir of potential support for a very radical federal or even confederal but federal proposal but I simply don't think the work has really been done and one of the problems with the constitutional change that has taken place is that it's been done in the back of an envelope and it's not been thought through and a lot of the powers that perhaps should have been given have been given and other powers perhaps which perhaps weren't that important after all uh, were seen as the the things that people were campaigning for so I think that there is um, a big issue around about that there's also a massive issue in terms of this meeting round about the repatriation of powers from Europe and where those powers go and I just flagged that up as something maybe to be discussed in as the meeting goes forward. Okay, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to do so because I see our attendees have put up their hands uh, and they do want to ask questions. So perhaps just to give Graham a bit of a uh, uh, heads up that uh, I will uh, be asking you to respond first once we collect uh, the questions. So at least you know to expect it. Uh, um, so uh, I see questions from Steve Freeman and Sue Rune. So perhaps we start with Steve. You've been unmuted. Steve, you can ask your question now. You're still muted. Um, it appears that. So, so although we have, you, you are muted on your computer. Okay, let's let's take the question from Sue for now, and then we'll. Steve. Is that yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> So, um, okay, um, so you're logged in from two accounts. This is why we're getting an echo. I, I will have to ask you to leave one of them. You're, I see you're attending twice. So in the meantime, uh, we'll, we'll actually get to take the question from, uh, from Sue. 
myself. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Right, okay. Um, so I'm not sure mine's a question exactly. Well, I haven't been able to frame it as a question, but it's an observation. I, I approach the question of um, Scottish independence and the whole debate from the perspective of someone who spent the most of my life living in the south of England in a staunchly conservative seat and I've only been in Scotland two or three years um, and I think what I was what I, I'm struggling with a little bit is I think your obs the observation about the centralization of government in the UK um, I think it's worth looking at the impact of that on ordinary voters because what I experienced very much in, in Kent, in Sevenoaks, was an attitude of mind which basically re abdicates responsibility for political decisions. It's a whole bunch of people who say, it's not my place to question that. I just vote for the usual person and I leave all the decisions to them. It's not my job to question it. And that's where you get Brexit from because you get people who don't want to engage in the actual political arguments as to whether it's a good thing for the country or not, you just get people who say, right, I've made up my decision, I'm going to vote for the person who appeals to my emotional state of mind, and that's all they see as their, their responsibility. So I just think that when, uh, I think it was Graham, was kind of writing off England in terms of political change, but I think the more we can build on the outpouring of community support and people coming together during the current crisis and the more we can empower those people to make their own decisions and think things through and talk to each other about stuff the more likely we are to bring a, a bottom-up movement towards change because we can't use top-down tools to create a bottom-up movement so that's a bit of a muddled point but that was the point I was I wanted to put across Thank you very much, Sue. And we have one more question from uh, Luke. Uh, Luke Cooper, please. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. So um, my question is about um, using the powers that the Scottish Government have at the moment um, to invest more in Scotland and what you think about that. Because the SNP, whatever happens with the independence question, have been in power a long time in Scotland and will be in power in terms of Scottish politics for a long time. And my, I'm an ag quite agnostic on any questions of sovereignty in Europe and everywhere else because there are always um, question marks over how much sovereignty and power you get with independence or with the status quo. There are lots of uncertainties in terms of the independent monetary policy or membership of the euro, whether that would actually mean that Scotland in practice has more power. But what we can say going forward into the future is that globalization in general is probably going to mean that there's less global outsourcing in production networks, uh, that there's loads of new technology happening that means that production can be more locally sourced. And I think that's an opportunity for Scotland and an opportunity for anyone to actually use the revenue raising and taxation powers it has to pioneer and develop more sustainable industrial investment policy, whatever happens with the national question. Thank you very much. We will take one more question because I see Steve has managed to reconnect and he's already raised his hand again. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, try. Uh, Steve, you're unmuted. Unmute myself. Host. Yeah, can you hear me? I can't hear. I can't hear. Okay, we can hear. I hear myself anyway. But anyway. okay. Um, I think uh, I, I agree with what I, I agree with what Adam was saying. Essentially, we actually need in this country a radical democratic change, because without that, the people of this country can't get power or control of what's going on in the country. Now, Scotland's gone quite far in that direction through its own parliament and a different constitutional settlement, but it hasn't totally, totally broken away. So I think that we need to do something about the crown, which Adam mentioned. But the crown is not the queen. 
the Queen is really the big distraction from the crown. It's like looking at the fairy on the top of the Christmas tree instead of looking at actually at the powers of the tree itself, where the power really is. And the power of the crown is really the state power, which is not controlled. So we need a radical democratic constitutional change, which is essentially what Adam was saying. And a federal kingdom or a federal monarch is not the answer to that. It's tinkering around with the existing system. We have to have a republic. Uh, Ireland is going that direction. Scotland's going that direction. England, obviously, a long way behind. So I, I want to ask a question. Are we going to put politics first or are we going to keep, as Corbyn was trying to tinker around with the existing system? Thank you, Steve. Uh, so I'll invite the panelists to speak. I don't particularly enjoy cutting people off, so I think perhaps it's best to say everyone has maximum five minutes to answer the three questions and uh, please do try to, uh, to, to comply. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Graham, please. Okay, I'll, I'll start with, with Sue by saying that I think I've, there were two things that I said in my, co like my contribution earlier, where I was very categorical about what I thought was progressive in the development sense in, in the English situation. I mentioned the uh, anti-austerity movement being reflected in the, the, the Corbyn movement in the Labour Party and being parallel to the movement for independence in Scotland. And I also mentioned that there were 10 million people who voted for that Party, despite the massive uh, uh, media onslaught against its leader. So it does give you a sense that there is a progressive working class consciousness in England too. That, that they have a different art that because we're different nations with different history and experience. You know, we mustn't look at any uh, uh, phenomena in the British Isles context where we ignore the, the national and consciousness and identity of the people we're talking about. And the fact is that the national consciousness and identity of English people is different because it is the centre of an empire. As you know, I'm a Londoner. Um, you know, so therefore I do care what happens because my family is still down there. I have family members who voted Brexit. I have a famous auntie. If you follow me on Facebook, you see that I have an auntie, I have two aunties, Auntie Val and Auntie Jean, and they they monster me each time I make any mention of the EU question. Every time my auntie's on there and my friends will gang uh, up on her and I have to say, auntie, I, I love you, but you're wrong on this. You know, she loves Nigel and all that. So, uh, but she says the same things about new migrants that people would have said about her in the 1960s. She's a Grenadian nurse. So, so the, the fact that somebody like that can have such a British nationalist consciousness, false consciousness, some people call it, tells you how deep and structural that attachment to British nationalism is and how dangerous an anti-working class it is. That's why you've got a Tory vote. That's why people like my aunties are voting for Boris. It's because it plays as national consciousness and national politics. Scots have an outlet which takes you away from that. That's our accident of history. It doesn't make us magically more progressive, but I think socialism in the UK will start in Scotland and it will start in Glasgow. Sorry, Adam, but it's starting in Glasgow. Uh, because I think we have a retained social consciousness of class and nation which comes together. For us, socialism and nationalism come together because it's the dynamic that we're part of. Um, in terms of powers, I want to say this about um, what Luke's question was about uh, uh, the government. And I think there is a strategy from the UK government to, uh, I think, basically try to grab powers from the European situation. So, for example, over agriculture, fisheries, that's just the, the most egregious example. But obviously, in Scotland, the land ownership is a massive problem. 16 to 18 percent of the land is owned by about 500 people. It, it's, it's ridiculously untaxed as, a, as, a, as an asset base. And the, the way that it's currently structured needs to change. But I think only an independent Scotland can really do very much about that. Um, but the powers they've taken as a result of Brexit meant that we were excluded from all of the, the major discussions with the European Union around fisheries and agriculture, which we're supposed to have under devolution, 100% under our control. But we clearly don't because they're, they're not obeying the devolution settlement that they actually have now. So we can't trust them to ever uh, you know, comply with a devolution settlement in the future. 
I think it is the Tory government strategy, though, to spend money in Scotland to show things with the UK government signing on it. That will be a phenomenon over the next period. I'm quite sure of that. There'll be pictures of Boris opening stuff in Scotland and then plaque made by the, the, the UK government. We'll see that as a tactic in dealing with the Scottish government's investment strategy. But obviously, most people won't know that for every penny that the Scottish government invests in major infrastructure, the UK government usually spends something as well, and vice versa. So if they have a project, usually the other government pushes in as well. So it's quite a lot of cooperation on those things. Not many people would know that. Uh, on Steve's point about radical democracy, obviously, the radical reshaping of democracy starts with Scottish independence and the breaking up of the UK and the end of the British Empire. The, I always say this, Babylon must fall. It's because we're still in the empire and that the empire must die. And it has to die by, by killing off the state form in which that empire still exists. That is the Westminster uh, system. It's got to go. It has to be destroyed by an act of its people. Our act will be voting for independence, but in England, the struggle will be different. I, I, it may well take the form of a federal uh, option. It may well take the form of a republic. But in my view, uh, I'm a, we are in SNP socialists, we're Republicans, but I think the question of the republic needs to be a question post-independence in a referendum of the people. Thank you. Adam, would you like to share your views as well? Sure, yeah. So I think Sue's point is really, really important, and it's a lot of what I write about in my day job. Because what you're talking about is what I would call alienation. It's the, um, the alienation of most people, particularly in those areas of the UK without any kind of devolved democratic settlement. So that's England outside London, um, although obviously that's slightly shifted, but not in significant ways over the last decade. Um, but, but primarily England outside London from the form of government they have, the only real form of government with any real power they have, which is the British state. So in Scotland, we have the Scottish Parliament, which kind of mediates and, uh, you know, acts a bit of a cushion between us and the British state. In London, they have their kind of mayoral system, which has limited powers, but at least some political expression, and so on. And, and people outside of that, people who live in England outside London, have experienced essentially the most centralised political structure in Western Europe. And those are also the people who voted for Brexit. As you say, you look, look at the stats, London didn't vote for Brexit, Scotland didn't, Wales only very narrowly did, nor, Northern Ireland didn't. It's, it's, as my colleague Anthony Barnett's always pointed out, it's England outside London which voted for Brexit, and that is the part of the UK which didn't get significant democratic reform in the kind of incomplete wave of constitutional change that came with the Labour government in 97, 98. And that's not a coincidence, because when you have government exactly as you say, that's that centralised, people feel very alien from it. They feel like they can have no real power over it. And so they fall back on other structures in which they can feel a place. And so some of those are gender and race hierarchies. And one of the most important ones is national hierarchies, which exactly as Graham says, is why people who are more alienated are more likely to fall for kind of nationalism and fall into racist and sexist tropes. I always remember um, in, in February, I was uh, right at the edge of Prague in this area of panel -like housing, interviewing people about their attitude of uh, politics in the Czech Republic. And a woman there said to me, oh, I, I don't believe in politics. And I said, so do you vote? Oh yeah, of course I vote. So you know, what do you believe in? I believe in the family. And so she voted for the right wing parties because she saw them as epitomizing the family. I think you see the same trick in English politics. People vote for the nation because they say, see no real power to um, change their lives through democracy and through politics, which is a kind of rarefied, distant form. Uh, so I think you're exactly right. And for me, that is my point, that without significant change to the way the people of England are governed, they are likely to continue voting for essentially Anglo-nationalist parties. And as long as they keep voting for those parties, we won't get the kind of reform that we need. Um, and so, you know, that's in a sense why I think the best way, as Graham says, to break up the British state is to start with Scotland and Northern Ireland and force that change into England. I think that's, you know, that's the way to begin to address the alienation of people in Kent that you talk about. Um, I know I took a while on that. It's very quickly, um, exactly. Steve's right in the crown. You know, when I, the problem is the monarchy, I'm not interested particularly, I mean, I'm interested culturally in the phenomenon of the House of Windsor. But what I mean is that sovereignty in the UK, unlike any other Western state, lies with the Crown in Parliament, i.e. it's a centralised sort of elected despotic state. 
sovereignty in a real democracy lies with the people. And so we can't just pretend to have a federal system while maintaining sovereignty of the crown in parliament. We need a whole radical redistribution of power to the people of the country. And while in theory that you know, could be done through the UK, um, I think that's very, very unlikely to happen in the reality that we're in. And so that's why I think that, you know, that the most likely way that's going to begin is with, as I say, Scotland and Northern Ireland leaving the UK. Very comprehensive. Thank you so much. Katie, your turn. Uh -huh. um, well, I think Sue's absolutely right to focus on the cultural issues. Um, and I think there are a huge number of parallels actually between what happened in Scotland during the independence referendum and what happened in England during the European referendum. Because I think as Sue also said, um, you know, the Brexit vote was a vote for change as well. Um, I think what was interesting during the two and a half years of the independence referendum that I lived through was the way that more people politically engaged. Um, I, I do have a problem with some of what's being argued in terms of the, the idea that the way that you fundamentally transform society, that you fundamentally make the economic and social changes that are needed in society, which will involve huge transfers of power and wealth, comes through nationalism. Um, and I think one of the problems of this period of, of politics in Scotland has been the fact that, the in, and I alluded to this in my opening remarks, is that the independence issue has been so central, as opposed to um, the kind of real sort of movements um, for the kind of economic changes that are needed, obviously not just in Scotland, but, you know, throughout Europe. Um, so in terms of what Sue's saying, the, the, the whole idea of how we empower, how we build those movements is central, I think, probably to what a lot of us are about. But what I would say is it has to be um, through economic demands, because if we end up with an independent Scotland that doesn't change, um, the, you know, fundamentally the structures um, in terms of how society works, um, then, you know, that is from, in terms of left-wing politics I don't think takes us anywhere and if we look at and it's not about the SNP but if we look at what the, the Scottish Parliament has done up to now it hasn't been as radical in any way as it could be whether that's on land whether that's on um, investment whether that's in um, you know the political choices um, that it's made even during this COVID um, period to a large extent it's been identical policies both north and south um, of the border so for me um, you know, it's about how do you get that radical economic, social and political change um, and that economic empowerment. Uh, and that has to be hand in hand with democratic empowerment. We have a whole range of powers that will be coming back, um, you know, probably as a result of um, the, the Brexit deal and where those powers go, I think is fundamental to this discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the whole kind of... Um, uh, issue about where powers lie isn't, I think, something that people are particularly engaging with at this precise moment, given everything that's going on. But I think the upheaval of this period that we're going through is going to, I hope, engage many, many people in some of these issues about what kind of society we want um, and where those powers should lie and how people have an input into that. So in terms of the sort of the fundamental issue about, well, to what extent will Europe have an influence over um, any you know, decision by the Scottish people about whether they choose to go independent or not, um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I think it'll just be one factor. Um, and I think a lot of these wider issues that have been raised in terms of where power lies, how it's possible to change things, how it's possible to give people a voice, um, and, and how it's possible to really turn around um, deprived communities is going to be far more key. And unfortunately, the Scottish Parliament hasn't fundamentally really addressed any of those things um, in towns and villages and indeed the cities of Scotland, um, which have far, far more in common um, with, you know, the towns, cities and villages in the north of England um, uh, than um, I think quite often it is, is really kind of um, made in, in many of the debates. Um, so I would hope that going forward that the focus isn't on the border and the focus is on how we build those movements that actually shift the whole kind of political and economic terrain that we have these discussions in. Okay, 
thanks for to each of you for sticking to the five minutes. I'm uh, impressed and uh, very rich answers as well, uh, compressed in that time. So uh, thanks. Um, we do have one more hand that's raised. And so uh, we will first hear from uh, Christopher Ford. Uh, and after that, if you'll allow me, I'll ask a question as well. So uh, Christopher, please, you're, uh, you're unmuted from our side. You have to unmute yourself now. Christopher? Okay. Um, unfortunately, we can't hear you. You're still muted. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead with my question for now. And then once Christopher manages to unmute his uh, his microphone, we can hear from him too. Um, I noticed quite a few people also wrote in the chat box uh, or brought up questions about citizenship. And I do find that uh, to be a fascinating aspect of the debate. Uh, I've been quite involved in EU citizenship uh, activism for the past few years. And I do know that, um, in fact, uh, I think yesterday there was a court uh, case brought forward uh, to the ECJ that effectively uh, makes the point that uh, UK citizens remain EU citizens after Brexit. And so I wonder what, how do you perceive the dynamics between the different layers of citizenship in this discussion? Because presuming that um, the case proves to be uh, accurate, and then uh, Scottish citizens would be EU citizens, um, would, would that, uh, you know, how, how does that change the debate, um, the debate inside the UK, I would, I would ask. And I think Christopher wrote his question. Oh, no, he was cut off. Well, Christopher, you're back on the line and it doesn't look Thank like you did, so, okay. Oh, hi. Uh, sorry, I, ju I just I wanted to start making the point uh, I disagree that you can counterpose social questions and national questions. I think the national question is a social question. And I think it's, a, it's been a dangerous approach of some socialists to take that view for a long time in Scotland. And it's partly led to the isolation of the traditional left in Scotland, I believe. Uh, I, I think maybe, Katie, it's worth reviewing that in light of what happened. Uh, to the Labour Party in particular. Uh, I also have to say that I think it's been a huge error to identify socialist politics with a uh, hundreds of years old act of union uh, made by two totally corrupt and undemocratic institutions, uh, which we seem to be relying on in the 21st century in large parts of the Labour movement. I think there is a case to be made for federalism, uh, and I don't think it's something that should be left undeveloped. Uh, and I don't think we can not argue for federalism just because it hasn't been developed. Uh, but I do believe that arguing for federalism shouldn't be uh, something conditional. Uh, we should defend self-determination now, whether we're arguing for it or not. And I think that, uh, I think that's, that's, that, that, that has to be done very strongly, particularly in England. But I wanted to really come to a question, how do we, as socialists in England, uh, for I'm in England, actually, even though I'm from Hamilton. Uh, how do we respond to this situation in terms of the Scottish national question today? Because it does have a significant impact on the rest of the UK. And I don't think this is debated enough. I particularly think we shouldn't be arguing, as internationalists in England, uh, that uh, essentially we keep this prison house of nations, this, keep it and restrict ourselves in this constitutional prison, by opposing a, a new referendum at the present time. I think we really need a, a, a different approach. And I was hugely disappointed by Corbynism on this issue. Uh, I think it was a huge blind spot of Corbyn in terms of the, the constitution of the UK state, in terms of unionism. And I think if we need to learn anything from this uh, tragic failure of the last few years, it's the approach to the national question in the UK. And so far, I've seen very little to encourage me that there is any significant rethinking taking place. And I really would like to see that happen soon. For the record, I supported independence the last referendum. Uh, I would support it again, but I would love it if we could have a federalist option. And then I would back federalism. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. Katie, would you like to go ahead uh, and respond first? 
other questions? I first of all, to um, take up the issue about self-determination. Scotland is a nation and Scotland is entitled to self-determination. The people of Scotland are entitled as a nation to determine whether they wish to be independent or whether they wish to have a relationship um, constitutionally with the rest of the UK. And I think that's the starting point of this discussion. And I think all the panellists, um, if you like, that was accepted um, within the discussion, um, Christopher. Um, in terms of um, the issue about how do we as socialists in England respond, I mean, obviously, socialists should have a view on anything that's happening anywhere in the world. But fundamentally, whether Scotland decides to become independent is a matter for people of, in Scotland. Um, and, and that debate takes place fundamentally in Scotland, although obviously people are entitled to their views wherever they live in the world and whatever their nationality and whatever their background. Um, it, the national question is a social question, but I think the problem with Scottish politics is that it has completely dominated Scottish politics um, to the eradication almost of everything else. Um, and I think that has dumbed down the debate in many ways on many of the kinds of radical political changes we could make in Scotland, even with the powers um, that exist both in local government and indeed, um, you know, in, in the Scottish Parliament now. Um, and the more that you do, the more demands you might make in terms of what more powers you need to be able to do whatever it is that, that requires to be done, whether that's to do with um, land reform or borrowing or whatever those those powers um, may be. Um, you know, the, the Act of Union is not something that I defend, um, but we live in an island and we live in a relatively small island. And for many people um, on the left, they're, they're, the focus of the politics isn't about where a border is. Um, it's about the, the way that we live and the rights that we have and the way that we live as a society. So, um, Suzanne, I think, you know, th this whole idea of citizenship, which is a concept in, in Britain, and, you know, it's interesting to hear about the, the, the court case, um, but I think the whole, irrespective of where we end up in terms of the legalities with our relationship with the U European Union, the, the basic position should be that we um, have no, you know, we've got no written constitution at the moment, but the w part of the way that we must go forward is about a rights-based community where people have rights, whether that's the right to housing, um, you know, the right to live, um, the right to an income. That, to me, seems the building blocks in which that we start to have this debate. Um, I am someone that doesn't support the status quo in terms of the constitutional settlement in, in the UK. I, I don't particularly want to go down the path that, um, you know, that Graham's outlining in terms of independence. I think there's a huge um, amount of work that could be done roundabout, whatever you want to call it, whether it's home rule, whether it's federalism, whether it's, it's confederalism, which, you know, obviously, as I said earlier, the power is in a slightly different place. Um, because it seems to me that whatever happens, we need to find a way on these islands of working as cooperatively as possible. Now, what happens in terms of a relationship with the EU is going to be a factor in that. Um, but our main relationships are actually with each other, Scotland and England and Wales, rather than with the EU. And, and particularly for Scotland, the main relationships are still going to be with the south of the border. Um, and, you know, that is going to be the backdrop against which any debate going forward is, is going to take place. So um, I think I've addressed the questions that were asked. Susanna, um, uh, I haven't read the court case, so I can't really comment in any detail on it, I'm afraid. Um, thank you so much. Uh, the comments were, um, were perfect because, in fact, uh, it's just the, the notion, the concept of citizenship that could, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, prevail uh, post-Brexit that was important in this debate. So I haven't read the court case either. I just know of it. I think it's an interesting idea. So could bring about a new development to, to this discussion. Uh, but so you refer to Graham. And so I think it's only polite now to, to ask him to speak. Uh, thank you, Susanna, and thank you, Katie. Um, I, I think I, I, I've actually liked the con contributions you've made for the most part, and uh, this is the only bit really where I've disagreed with you, and uh, I'm going to be agreeably disagreeing with you. Um, 
you used some of the the, the classic arguments actually you, you know we've got more in common we uh, we should focus on economic demands and i think the, the, the comments have already made that point and you indeed conceded it that it, you can't separate uh, the so-called national question from economic and social demands they are both national and economic whether you you like it or not we just that just they are um but i suppose to answer this question i've written down in my notes before we, we got there citizenship versus civic nationalism you also did the classic uh, use that word nationalism without actually being very specific about what it means in the scottish context right in most countries in the world nationalism means uh, a kind of economic exclusive often racially defined nationalism which it, which includes an in group and excludes an out, uh, everybody else from that definition Civic nationalism in Scotland is different. It's essentially for the last 40 years, the SNP has been based on a concept that everybody who lives in Scotland is Scottish. Not ethnically defined, not culturally defined, not based on your attachment to shortbread tin eating uh, or whiskey drinking or any of that nonsense. It's actually uh, down to what is a citizen in a country, what those rights should be as an individual citizen versus what the rights of the collective as the, the nation should be. The Brexit referendum was premised on two fundamental negative in, in questions around citizenship. What nationalists in Britain wanted to do was to scapegoat sections of the international working class resident in the United Kingdom as being responsible for all the social ills. They demanded discrimination and layering and attacks on the equal rights of three and a half million EU citizens. And basically that referendum was about relegating those people to second class citizenship in the UK and it was successful and it was a reactionary project that that was premised on excluding the access of citizens to things like the health service uh, equal education free stuff that we all get as citizens from the state it was all premised on excluding people from that whereas Scottish nationalism is premised on including people in all of that and giving them not only the right to access these services but actually we want them to have the right to vote we just passed in Holyrood uh, motions to empower asylum seekers and refugees to have the vote in our referendum that's what we want we want everybody who lives here so it's the opposite of the nationalism that you were trying to associate us with and that that is somewhat annoying but it is understandable that people want to deflect into that question so for me the constitutional citizenship basis of the movement for independence is around what the role of citizens will be in a country not based on ethnicity and national identity and origin our five million people also have a collective set of rights which should be in a constitution we haven't got a constitution we haven't got a written one we've got law and precedent and as law you know this but our rights are based on these precedents based on in law we should have a written constitution which guarantee rights including the social rights that you talked about earlier which i totally agree with but i don't think we've gone anywhere near far enough i'm a socialist i want Scotland to be a socialist society but i want it by consent and i want it based on individual and collective rights and one of the things we have in the eu and the eu question is relevant to us because of course what do the five million people have as collective rights? Can we appeal to the European Court of Human Rights as a collective to get back our European citizenship rights? Because I want to get those back. I think that's not a tested question yet. I would like to see our government take a case to Brussels to demand the collective rights. At the moment, it's, you know, I've told that's not possible because we can only have individual freedoms, you know, the four freedoms, etc. Um, but I'd like to see our government test the idea that a country, a nation of people, a, a recognised jurisdiction within the European Union has a right to decide its own destiny about whether it leaves the EU, EU or not. That is very clear since 60 odd percent of our people voted to remain that to me is a democratic and political question we voted to remain i'm in a constituency which voted 60 percent remain 57 percent yes and 48 percent snp i'm in the most left-wing ward in the most left-wing constituency in this entire country now if our vote is not going to be respected then it can't be you know, we can't be contained within this state and within this set of juridical and constitutional traps. We need independence to exercise our right to self-determination. All those uh, layers I was referring to at the beginning of the conversation 
it's just becoming more and more fascinating as we go forward. I uh, would love to hear from Adam at this point to see what his take on, on this debate is. Sure, so, so just to start um, quickly with your question, Susanna, which I, I've not seen with Torque, okay, so I've also misunderstood it, but I think, you know, while I'm all in favour of having rights, the thing that I want and that I think we should have, you know, collectively is power. And so giving people in Scotland European citizenship without any power over what that means, I think is kind of a, you know, is, is a nice thing to have, but it's not particularly significant. I think that what we really want is democratic power to determine our collective future. Um, but to come on to the kind of meaty question we're discussing, that, um, you know, where Katie talked about how uh, she sees this, and a lot of people, you know, in, in Scottish Labour talk about this, the feeling that Scottish politics has taken a turn towards all these kind of irrelevant questions of, uh, of nationalism, and we should get on with the bread and butter issues of, of politics. I, I think that, for me, there's a number of problems with that line. The first is this. Anyone on the left is arguing that in some form, the state should have more say in over the economy and over significant aspects of our life than it currently does because neoliberalism has handed those decisions to the market. And people's experience of the state, particularly after 40 years of neoliberalism, is deeply problematic. So the reason people often don't kind of respond well to left-wing arguments is they look at politics as they see it, and they say, I don't believe in politics as a way to make these big decisions that we have to make together. I don't believe, you know, politics is another word for democracy. So people who don't believe in politics, you know, they, they therefore don't believe in the left-wing case as put forward by Corbyn, or in fact by any major Bernie Sanders or any major left-wing politician or politicians or movement across the world. And so then you have to start, start asking the question, well, how do we change politics so that democracy is seen as a viable way to make major decisions as a society um, rather than the market. And that, you know, is a big and enormous conversation that we have to have as Western societies right now, and one that the historic left has been quite bad at having because it's become fairly attached to traditional uh, nation states as they currently exist. And then what happens is that as soon as people begin to say, well, let's have different units of organizing, because at the moment we have nation states, so we have, you know, generally governments which are correlating their boundaries with the uh, boundaries of some kind of imagined community. And people say, well, you know, let's, let's redraw those boundaries somewhat. And people who are saying that, you know, get the finger pointed at them and say, you know, well, you're nationalists. And so we shouldn't have that conversation. We've got to defend, we're going to, we're going to stick with the current power structures as they exist. And I know Katie doesn't believe the second half of that, but that is the effect of that argument of, you know, pointing the finger of nationalism at anyone who calls for separation from the British state. And it's very, very dangerous to the left because the left has to answer the main skepticism there is with left politics, which is the belief that politics in general isn't the solution to our problems as society. And I think the other thing I find problematic about this is that people always say, you know, Scottish politics has been dominated by this nationalism over the last five years. But then we look to English politics and we look at the fact that um, Westminster, you know, particularly the English MPs voted to replace Trident nuclear missiles so that Britain can feel important on the world stage, despite the fact that the right-wing Tory chair of the Defence Select Committee pointed out that they don't work in the modern world because we've got drones these days that can find underwater submarines. We won't elect Corbyn, apparently, in England because he doesn't gen effects sufficiently to the Queen and doesn't wear the right kind of poppy. You know, we have a whole national culture in England that is dominated, you know, a whole British, across Britain, which is dominated by hegemonic nationalism. And anyone who kind of challenges that hegemonic nationalism with another kind of discussion of identity or collective expression is shouted down as a nationalist because they're not willing to kind of defer to the hegemonic nationalism. And so I think it's very important that those of us on the left do two things. The first is we do need to question Scottish nationalism because there isn't one hegemon, there wasn't one single identity in Scotland. I always think about Scotland with many traveller communities and you know, we, we need to be internationalist. And while the sort of civic nationalism Graham outlines is, you know, in a sense, a better thing than identity-based nationalism, we also need to recognize that there is a form of racist Scottish nationalism, which exists, which I'm, I'm sure, you know, you're more familiar with than I am, Graham. Um, and we need to, you know, push for a more pluralist and nationalist understanding of what the movement for Scottish independence is about. But we also need to resist this idea that accepting the kind of hegemonic British nationalism of the British state isn't a nationalist move, because that's just as nationalist 
as it is to challenge it from a Scottish perspective. Okay. Um, so as we're approaching the end of, of this discussion, and I see there are no more uh, questions from the attendees, um, could I please ask for uh, your final comments on uh, the current situation? So uh, more specifically, well, the, the COVID-19 um, crisis, and we're seeing uh, uh, an interesting debate emerging where we're also uh, noticing that uh, both in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, um, so the, the the, the move has been one to propose an alternative uh, response to the one from Westminster and that uh, the two parliaments there are ready to, to maybe uh, have a different approach, uh, which, is, which seems to be more aligned with the, the, the approach that the Republic of Ireland is taking. Um, so just if you could uh, maybe wrap up uh, the, and to finalize your, your, uh, your remarks by um, sharing with us what you think this crisis means for the, the future of Scotland in uh, Europe. So, uh, and I think I have to now uh, pick uh, someone to start. This is becoming difficult. Uh, so perhaps I could ask Graham again to, to go first. If, if, you're, uh, if you could unmute yourself. You're still muted, yeah. Uh, I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, I, I can't really give you a full rundown of COVID, but I think essentially there has been massive social solidarity and mutual aid across communities everywhere. So, and I think that's true everywhere across this country and across uh, the UK. But I, I have to say that I think the caution of the government in criticizing the UK led strategy ha is partly down to not wanting to play politics with this issue. Uh, and I do think that that's probably the main consideration here. Uh, but the, certainly the Scottish government has had a slightly different uh, response. Obviously, because the disease is essentially two weeks behind in Scotland, where it is in the south of East of England, our lockdown has occurred earlier in the spike. Uh, therefore, we haven't quite had as severity in the, the level of deaths and uh, infections. Uh, so we're lucky in that respect that the lockdown has been a little bit more complete. Uh, we've been more uh, consistent around questions of what workplaces are essential and not essential. So building sites have stopped in Scotland, whereas I've had many reports that down south they have continued. So non-essential stuff is less uh, permitted in the Scottish context. Uh, but that hasn't been there hasn't been problems with this. So I, I think that the the obvious thing is that the PPE questions and the question of public testing. At the moment, Scotland is about uh, up to about 3,000 daily tests. That would be the equivalent of 30,000 daily tests in the wider UK context. So we are not yet there in terms of being able to test everybody who needs to be tested and, and doing the monitoring, the surveillance. Uh, but it's pretty clear that the, the intention is that this lockdown needs to continue for considerably longer than everybody anticipated because that will be required and in that context how do we keep democratic rights and freedoms alive and this is the, the point here that not only is you know parliament meeting in scotland and obviously now that westminster is back uh, but also the political parties however they're communicating by means that we're communicating with now politics needs to be able to continue in some way. And one good thing is that I've been able to join lots of discussions like this, which I normally wouldn't have time for. Uh, and that, that's really important that we're able to share lots of observations and experiences around dealing with COVID-19, which I hope will lead to some fundamental change. And I think they will do, because as you was rightly pointed out earlier in the conversation, uh, the relocalizing of the economy you know, the supply chain and having more uh, public intervention to that process of supply and demand and need locally, especially around food distribution, but also amongst other things, uh, pushes us to that model. We, we can't go back when we come out of lockdown to what happened before because it was wasteful, it was environmentally destructive. I should imagine that our, our carbon footprint and our climate change stats have massively improved during this lockdown. I've noticed that the air is a lot cleaner uh, and I think people also appreciate the fact that they're able to see their children rather than work all hours, God sense. You know, 
So when we come out of this lockdown, one of the issues we've raised is about having a, a four day working week, having a universal basic income. Uh, I think the chances of us implementing some of those things, and there's some problems around exactly how we define it, but also the, the environmental policy around the Green New Deal. That's a quite broad consensus of ideas that are shared across party. And I think there's a majority in parliament for that and a lot majority in society for many of those uh, measures to move away from fossil fuel production, uh, which has been shut down. And we know the fossil fuel production is at the heart of the future economic crisis that's coming ahead of us because we've got zero prices for, for barrels of oil right now. So that makes that whole industry in the industrial base in the northeast of Scotland uh, economically unviable right now in, if, it, if lockdown carries on. So we have even more uh, uh, reason to move away from fossil fuel production, carbon polluting industries. We can move towards just transition. I think that would be a major element of a public discussion as we come out of COVID. Uh, so I, I think that moves us closer in the direction of socialism and internationalism. Uh, because the people are more empowered and I think they won't go back to how it was before with no trade union rights at work, no enforcement of health and safety, people are joining unions, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, we will come out of this stronger, I believe, and more progressively focused on where the future society should be and how different it will be from the society that we've got now. Let's certainly hope so. I noticed uh, Katie was agreeing with you, so uh, would be would be nice to, to hear from her. I, and before I do that, I'm going to have to come back on some of what Adam was saying, because I wasn't pointing fingers at, any, at anybody or shouting anyone down as nationalists. Um, but I've experienced nationalism in my life in Scotland. I know what it is. Um, and um, I, I don't think nationalism is a positive force. And, and, and that's, that's the point I was making. Obviously, we don't really have time to explore that in any detail, but I wasn't saying it in an offensive way. And I, you know, I don't consider myself a unionist, but people shout that at me um, or shout that to others who, who didn't agree with a particular proposal that was made in 2014. So I don't think this debate has been about name calling and I don't think we should descend into that. And maybe Adam didn't realise you know that that maybe is what he was doing but but you know I don't think it's particularly helpful in terms of COVID um, up till now the Scottish Par um, Parliament and, and government in particular has largely mirrored the strategy down south I think everywhere what we should be looking for is um, a strategy that's based on testing um, that's based on protection and PPE um, and um, that it is driven by health needs and containing this virus um, and, and those should be the criteria um, you know in any part of, of, of these islands in terms of the way that we come out of this crisis um, until we have some form of vaccine or some form way of dealing with this virus um, then I think those measures are going to be in place for quite some time um, but I think Graham's absolutely right in saying that this is a real opportunity um, because of the fact that so much the society has almost been put on hold to start you know, using this as an opportunity um, to, to put forward some of the arguments um, about how we come out of this economically in terms of green sustainability, um, that you know, we should be trying to source as much as possible as locally as possible, that we shouldn't be, you know, importing all our plastic toys if, um, from China, that those probably toys shouldn't be plastic and they shouldn't be coming halfway around the world um, to be used. So I think this is, you know, some of the, the, the changes that people are making in their lives in terms of how they source what they need, um, I think opens up a real opportunity to sort of, um, you know, challenge some of the ways that society has developed over the last few decades, the very disposable way that we've developed, um, and that we need to use this as an opportunity to put forward a new economic model. And that really is irrespective of all of these constitutional issues. A lot of those arguments are the same wherever you live, whether you live in Germany, whether you live in Spain, whether you live in Scotland, whether you live in England. Um, and I think this is a real opportunity to put forward um, a lot of those arguments and any constitutional settlement has to be based on, well, how can you best deliver on some of those, those things that we want to do? Um, and I suppose that's, that's, you know, 
where some of the debate is. I think going forward, some of the issues, the immediate issues around about repatriation of powers, whether that's fishing, agriculture, etc. I think those are very real debates that it's important that we have views on at this time and we argue on um, at this time to put forward the position as to where those powers should go to deliver on the, that kind of model of society that we've been talking about. I couldn't agree more. So let's see what uh, what Adam has to say to that, or to the general question. <laughs> so, so, so first, um, apologies to Katie. I, I shouldn't have um, come you with many of your colleagues like that. I accept your position has always been much more subtle than the one I caricatured there. So uh, apologies if you felt like I was lumping you in with um, with much of the rest of the College of Labour. When I, I I do accept you always uh, played a more constructive role in this conversation. Um, uh, I, I mean, I agree with pretty much everything else the other two have said, so I won't, I won't repeat that. Um, I just add two little notes to that. Um, the, the first is just on the kind of narrower Scottish question, which is not particularly, I mean, it's not, you know, the most important dimension of this global conversation, but it's what we're talking about today. Um, I, th I think that it, it's right to, and I have on Twitter, to criticise the Scottish government for essentially, at least at the start of this crisis, copying the response of Boris Johnson, et cetera. Um, I accept they've moved away from that position somewhat since then, as Graham outlined. But I think it's also worth thinking about that in terms of the political economics of it and contrasting the response of the Scottish government with that of the Irish government. And I think for me, what that shows you, you really is how devolution works in a crisis. And crisis is when politics really changes, which is that Scotland is able to do slightly different things within the framework set by the British state but it's not able to take a radically different position because it doesn't have the powers or the kind of cultural power to do so, where the, the Irish state was able to take a radically different position. And for me, that shows kind of one of the failures of devolution and why I think that we need to move beyond devolution towards, I would argue for independence to have, but you know, we can talk about other models that, as we also have. I think that's important. Um, I think that the oil price collapse um, accentuates what's always been the sort of green left position on Scottish independence, which is the Scottish economy needs to move beyond oil rapidly and in as just a way as possible, in any case, irrespective of through what constitutional framework. And we can talk about that in the British states all through independence. I happen to think that's more likely to happen through more power for the people, but that's we don't have time for that conversation. And the final thing I'd say is while I agree that we need to be fighting for all the positive things that both of my comrades here have talked about. The, um, I think we also need to understand that the right is having the same conversation now about how they're going to use this crisis to, on the one hand, push much more authoritarian nationalist measures. And my um, colleague, Claire Provo, who's based in Italy, has chronicled how kind of right-wing groups around the world are responding to this crisis in very scary ways, particularly attacking women's rights and trying to push women back into the home and continuing the kind of ban on abortions we've seen across the world as a result of this crisis. Um, and, and secondly, the kind of more uh, neoliberal right and how it's going to use that authoritarianism to sort of stamp out dissent against the onward march of the market. And my colleague, Laurie McFarlane, wrote a great piece about the kind of Chinese model of authoritarian capitalism and how through this crisis, we might see its extension into the West much more. We've already seen that in Hungary and places a bit. And so I think, you know, as the left, we both need to be pushing for, um, you know, building the alternative we want, but we also uh, can't assume we're just going to get it through this crisis. We might also get worse unless we fight against it. Thank you so much. And I think it's, uh, it's uh, time to, to say goodbye. Uh, just before I uh, do so, I wanted to show you that I did get to, to look at Scotland as we speak. So this is the Irish Sea. I'm actually based in Northern Ireland. And on a sunny day, I can uh, uh, <laughs> properly wave, and uh, we can. Uh, um, yes, hopefully we can uh, see positive developments from the current crisis. And I think it's quite a nice community that uh, another Europe uh, is possible, and European alternatives have created. So hopefully we will stay in touch. Um, and uh, it was a pleasure to have you as panelists. And thank you so much to everyone who attended. I wish you a wonderful weekend. <laughs> Bye bye bye. Thanks for organizing.